Hi everybody, welcome to another episode of Toy Guys Talking, and it's my honor, my pleasure to have on board Lieutenant Carson Metaxas. Sir, a big salute to you and everything you've done for the G.I. Joe community. Carson Metaxas is the guy behind 3D Joes, so not just the amazing website with all of the incredible G.I. Joe artwork archived there for everyone to see, but also the art of G.I. Joe which I've gone through on the channel and I had such a blast reading through all of them. And I just, I love those books so much. Here's a testament to how much I love those books. I never gave much time or thought to those later Joes, the, yep. uh, the 90s Joes, right? Especially 92, yep. 3, 4. I've picked yep. up a bunch of them at uh, recent local toy shows because of looking through your books and going, these aren't these aren't too bad actually. I, so I, you, I've watched I've watched your videos, man, and I saw you falling in love with a couple of them. Like I there did. was a stalker, you know, where he's all in black and he's got the little touches of green. You're like, I've never, even, I didn't even know this existed. Yep. You know, still looking so for to him. me. It's the exact same thing with me when I when I started building 3D Joes, man. I collected GI Joe in the 80s. I stopped in 1990. My last figures were 1990 figures, and 1990 is a great year. Awesome accessories, really, really good high quality vehicles still. Um, I think it's the last great year in terms of vehicles and figures consistently great throughout. The vehicles definitely took a dip, in my opinion, after that. Um, but there's still that hit and miss good one here and there. But 1990 is like, to me, the last great consistent year across figures and vehicles. But so same as you, I didn't really get into 91 to 94. It was just kind of past my time. I was 11 years old. I transitioned into comic books thanks to Larry Hama. Yeah. And, and my passion just moved on to comic books. Um, so as I started building 3D Joes, I didn't own 91 to 94. I had to go collect all of it, buy it. Uh, this might um, really hurt some people out there, but <laughs> every figure from 91 to 94, I bought it. I photographed it, mint on card, and then I razored that bubble off, yeah. man. And, and all those figures that are on 3D Joes are literally brand new off the card figures. Um, and so it was a really big learning experience for me, just like getting to know these guys and falling in love with some of them, like Shipwreck version two, top tier, yes. top tier figure and accessories. Is like that, anybody. Is that the 94 one, the wetsuit one? Yeah, oh, yeah it's black it's and gray. He, he, I, he got I, an upgrade, you know, he became a Navy SEAL and started diving. I didn't even know about that figure until my pal Lou, Lightning Lou, uh, pointed this one out to me and he said he was looking for it. And I'm like. Anything past 90, I don't really care. Like, I was a 82 to 86 guy. You know, yep. if it was post-Sunbow, I don't really care. Yep. But when I saw that one, I was like, oh, that one's really nice. What year was that? Expecting it to be 87, yep. right? 87, 88. Yep. 94. I'm like, uh-oh. The end. <laughs> That's, the uh, end. That means the very there's tale. a lot of potentially really awesome figures, yep. you know, from, from end to beginning. Um, right. So the art of G.I. Joe... Uh, what, what's one uh, one of your favorite, well, obviously, Lieutenant Falcon, probably one of your favorite G.I. Joe right. art pieces, right? Right. Well, so uh, still a Hector Garrido classic, right? And so anything Hector Garrido is just top tier. I, it's amazing, incredible anatomy, perspective, uh, hue, shading, rendering, you know, shadows, depth, all that stuff. He was an absolute master. Uh, this guy came from Argentina. He's an Argentinian-American, first-generation immigrant, which is a very timely topic in the United States today. Um, you know, my grandfather came over from Greece in 1904. Uh, excuse me, my great grandfather came over from Greece in 1904. My grandfather was one of 350 triple CIB winners. That's a combat infantry badge. That means you dodged bullets during wartime. So he fought in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, and he was a first generation American. Have you, so, have you uh, given him a code name? Uh, <laughs> the, nah, the general. Actually, the Afghanis gave him a code name. During Charlie Wilson's war, he was in his 70s. Uh, this is Theodore. Anybody who wants to look this guy up thinks I'm full of shit. <laughs> Google Theodore Christopher Metaxas. Just Google him. He's a brigadier general. He did, uh, you know, he served at Valley Forge Military Academy as the commandant. He joined the CIA and was working with them on different stuff. During Charlie Wilson's war, when the Russians occupied Afghanistan from 79 to 89, he took nine or ten different missions in his 70s. He would fly to Pakistan travel the Kashmir Mountains wow. uh, into Afghanistan and deliver these surface-to-air Stinger missiles and rockets to shoot down the Russian helicopters. Um, Is so he they the him... man who killed Hitler and then the Bigfoot? <laughs> no. <laughs> Have you heard about this movie? Sam Elliott no. is in a new movie called The Man Who Killed Hitler and Then okay. the Bigfoot. And then the big. That's ridiculous. It, but it um, is actually a really good like drama. As, as really? ridiculous as the title nice. seems, you think it's yeah, going to be yeah. some goofy comedy. It's actually about a guy who has to carry the weight of he killed Hitler, but he killed him too yep. late. 
Uh, and okay. then they come in, and it, that just reminded me of your seventy-year-old, yeah. you know, grandfather. Who's, he was a superhero growing up, man. Like I, I would go to his house. He lived in Southern Pines where I was living with my parents, obviously. And um, we would go down the street and visit him all the time. He had military paraphernalia everywhere. Oh, Stuff, cool. you know, relics from World War II. When he went into World War II in 1944, um, he helped liberate a couple French towns, um, Oting and Forbach, which uh, me and my brother just went to visit a year and a half ago. And um, – he took the Nazi paraphernalia stuff from the mayor's office because the mayor was a turncoat Nazi sympathist and, and uh, sympathizer. And so he took that stuff from the mayor's office, stuck it in a duffel bag and shipped it home. So we're going into his house and he's got these like little clay figurines. They're wire armature uh, with clay and then hand painted. And there's like little Nazi kids. There's Nazi army. There's Nazi vehicles. There's like little. There's a little Hitler. He had one point of articulation where his uh, arm goes up. Yikes. So. Growing up around my granddad, with him having all this shit in the house, I thought he was a superhero, man. He was, he was amazing. That's but, one uh, of those, like, those Nazi paraphernalia is kind of priceless and worthless at the same yeah, time. Because, like, right. who, you know, like... There's actually a subject. lot... There's a lot of collectors that love anything related to war memorabilia, right? Well, there's so, people who collect the Neon Joes, so absolutely, right? The, <laughs> the Eco Warriors and the Star Brigade. Like anything. <laughs> yeah. But, but so, what was, I, what was his code name? That was a long segue, right? Yeah. Uh, sorry to give you the whole background. I'm just really no, proud of my family. That's what Toy Guys Talking is all about. We, we uh, start with toys and we can talk 45 minutes about something else. Right. So his code name was General Uzo because there's a Greek liqueur called Metaxa, M-E-T-A-X-A. And his father's name when he came through Ellis Island was Metaxa. And they slightly tweaked it at Ellis Island. They heard Metaxa and they wrote down Metaxas, you know. Yeah. Um, so there's the Metaxa Uzo, which is like a black licorice uh, kind of uh, after dinner drink or whatever. Right. And they nicknamed him General Uzo because of that. Ah, uh, cool, cool. Have you ever come up with one and like a file card for him? I have not. That's not a bad idea, though. And then I should get a customizer to do a figure of him because he's very like iconic. He was just bald since I ever knew him, you or, know. Or you can do one yourself, sixth scale. That's always right? fun to do too. Anything you can imagine exists in the sixth scale already. I did uh, a project years ago, just a, like a little little fun thing with friends, where I played kind of a, a real life GI Joe, kind of a GI Joe slash Hannibal from the A Team. And I made the 12 inch figure because I found oh, the wow. vest, the exact tan nice. vest with the black shoulder and the, you know, the gloves and the everything, the pants. So that'd be a cool project. Nice. Um, tell me a little bit about Hector for people who don't know. Uh, so sure. he did all of the first year up until when did Hector do the art? Right. So it's a. Uh... I can give you a time frame. I can't give you an exact date. Like on this date, the contract right. was terminated. But right. I can give you a time frame and tell you what I do know. Um, so Hector Garrido was, like I was saying, an Argentinian American first generation you, immigrant. Just to illustrate here, do you think shipwrecks named after him? Uh, Delgado, isn't it Delgado? <laughs> yeah, but Hector. Hector. Yeah, I, absolutely. I could definitely see that happening. <laughs> Does the he look like is, Hector? Would Larry at Marvel? know about Hector, who was working at Werben Moral, whatever, like the, the four names. I'll, I'll look up the uh, ad agency name. It's in the book. Yeah. The only reason that it's confusing is the name changed in 1983 because the packaging a agency, Ed Moral, bought out his partner. And then it was just Moral and Associates or whatever. Oh, and okay. then a year later, he partnered with three new guys, Siegel, whatever, or something. I've got it all written down. It's in the books. Right. But uh, so basically there was then four partners and that's the company that was employing Hector. So anyway, the question is whether or not that packaging company would have communicated to Marvel and Larry who are over here to get Hector's name from there to here. Right. And it could have happened. Um, so anyway, Hector moved to the United States after after school, I believe, after art school. And he had a, I'd say, 50-year career in the United States. Um, probably the first 20 years was doing book covers, uh, all paintings, doing book covers and like uh, covers for Time Magazine, TV Guide, that kind of stuff. So, so prominent, beautiful, painted illustrations. There's a Flickr page for Hector Garrido, if people want to see what he did outside of G.I. Joe, that actually has quite a few of his paintings documented. And I reached out to the guy that manages that page now, and I bought a bunch of those paintings, man. And they were... Man, I think he charged me anywhere from $25 for a small one to like $80 for a big one, like a, a complex one that like saw print, you know, he might've charged me 80 bucks for. Yeah. So I think I spent like $500 with this guy and just got like a dozen Hector Garrido paintings. Um, Originals. The, the, yeah, these are the 20 years before he got into packaging artwork. So he did that kind of stuff for 20 years. Um, he was found, his uh, ad agency is uh, Joe Mendola. So Joe Mandola was uh, out of 
uh, New York City. I've got the little placard right there. It's the only Garrido signature that I was able to carve off of one of those uh, paintings that I purchased. And you never see Hector's signature on anything, so it's awesome to have that piece right there. And I actually kind of keep it on my desk for inspiration, like be as good as this guy was. You know, like every day I do video and animation, but you need something that motivates you to like give your best every day. And when I look at Hector's work, man, like it's he's just a phenomenal artist. You you bring up the lack of signature on stuff, and credit is important, but. What I'm mm-hmm. what I'm noticing these days, like I'll I'll post a lot of toy art because I love it. It's beautiful. Mm-hmm. What I actually appreciate about the GI Joe uh, artwork, whether it was Hasbro's decision or Hector's humility, who knows? His mm-hmm. signature isn't on everything, oh. and and sometimes it's important. You know, everyone out there, don't get me wrong. It's important for the artist to get credit, but sometimes the artist doesn't necessarily want the credit. Sometimes the artist says the art is what's important. Not my name scrolled, you know, over the boot in the corner. Yeah. Or sometimes some people take it way too extreme. Some websites, you know, they plaster their website watermark, but mm-hmm. they only drop mm-hmm. the opacity 10%. So yeah, it's not really it. see-through. Right that's, through the middle. And I'm like... That's cre- a conscious decision that I've thirsty. made. Yeah, no, it's terrible. It's a conscious decision I've made with 3D Joe's. I have not watermarked a single image on that website and, you know, it hurts your feelings a little bit when you see people taking that and then sharing it on Facebook or sharing it on Twitter and not sharing where it came from. Because yeah. I don't selfishly want to drive traffic to my website. There's no ads on my website. and I don't make a nickel off of my website getting traffic, not a nickel. So it's not like selfish, like I want money from that. I spent years building this website. And if people enjoy that, I know they're going to love this. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I want, I want, if people share that stuff, I just want them to share where it came from so people can find the comprehensive library that we've assimilated over at 3D Joe's. And, um, I, and but, I really appreciate when someone looks at the art and goes, wow, look at the expression on Lieutenant Falcon's face, you know, the yep. true grit. Yep. And there are a few people out there who will look at it and go, um, you didn't credit Hector Garrido. You know, you didn't credit, like, it's yeah. okay, okay, fine. Credit, credit. Can, can we go to appreciate the art now instead of, right. Um, right. I just don't think the people who bring up the name He-Man, uh, Norem, is yep. uh, another you know major artist and he did sign yep. a lot of the art that he did so different packaging company and different toy manufacturer i think just my opinion is that hasbro didn't want anybody to sign any joe artwork absolutely because it's about you know, the character and when when you yeah. have your signature it's like you're kind of destroying the illusion yeah it, it, you're, these you're are making almost, it about you they're, yeah. yeah they're almost supposed to be photographs of these guys in action rather than we hired a guy to do a job a yep. job, not a passion, you know, yep. and he, he might have been very passionate about his work, but at the end of the day, you know, that's yep. how some people might interpret. So I, it's important well, to give then, Hector the credit he deserves, but at the same time, it's also important to appreciate the beautiful work he did instead of not talk about the work at all and just go, Hector Garrido, Hector Garrido, Hector, right. like, come on, man. Well, and there's a guy that his name is never mentioned that also deserves credit. If you're going into the credit conversation, when you talk about the GI Joe artwork of the early eighties, Hector Garrido was hired by a man named Ed Morrill who ran the packaging agency. Ed Morrill did the thumbnail sketches for all these figures to make sure there was original poses. When you put the original 11 on the shelves, he made sure that those 11 figures had unique poses and that put their accessories in the forefront that differentiated them and that kind of thing. So, wouldn't you have to give Ed Morrill credit too? Because like, yeah. if you look at it like a comic book, he's kind of the the penciler or like the storyboard artist, and then Hector is the the inker or the colorist or whatever. Like, the, it's a, it was a two man thing. Yeah. So where where does the credit stop? Like, how deep are we going to go with it every time we share a picture? I find it's important to not lose sight of you know enjoying the art for what it is, and you do the best you can with what you have to work with. But I yep. don't think it's necessary for every single piece of toy art. To say, I'm not allowed to talk about it unless I talk about the guy who yeah. who did this. You know, it's let's focus on on the amazing art. But like, what, what are some I don't of the... do it. I don't do it on 3D Joe's just to, to reinforce your opinion on that matter. On every page of 3D Joe's, I don't say card art courtesy of yeah. whoever, you know, storyboard uh, sketches courtesy of whoever. I just don't do that. I have a creator's tab and there's a few creators that have been documented and I hope to do a lot more of those in the future. But I'm going to put that in one place. I'm not going to put that on every page. Exactly. It's it's yeah. excess when it's like every single image. But what are some of the final Hector ones? Because I do yeah. I know like... 
as the years went on, the, the loss of Sunbow was a big thing that took the wind out of my sails for it, but also yep. the card art changed. And it's, I think it was the, the change in artist. Yeah. So uh, talked about this, I think, a little bit in volume four or five. It's, it's, a, it's a one or two pager called The Changing of the Guard. And essentially what happened was a, a lieutenant in the Army uh, that's only, you know, he served four years. He did ROTC and he went in the Army for four years. And then he moved to Manhattan to start his packaging career. That man was Ed Morrill. Uh, Ed Morrill was at this agency that he just joined within the last calendar year when Hasbro came in and was just kind of filling that agency out. Uh, and ended up busting his ass and setting up all these dioramas and taking these amazing photos of the 12-inch figures and winning the work. Uh, and that work blew up for him in the late 60s. He was there for the 12-inch Joes, the 8-inch Super Joes, and the 3 and 3-quarter-inch Joes that we love from the 80s. So he was on board with Hasbro as a, you know, a contracted uh, packaging firm from 1969 to 1989. They also did all of the Transformers box art. And when I said they did it, that means they hired the illustrators. They did created uh, sketches and directed the the artist on what to create. Um, I've got a book of his up here, packaging design and brand identity. The uh, company is called Coleman, La uh, Puma, Siegel, and Morrill, and that was the four partners after like 1983. So it was Werben and Morrill of uh, 69 to like 82. Uh, Morrill was doing so good with the Hasbro stuff that he ended up buying out the other guy, and it was just Ed Morrill. And then he ended up partnering with these three other guys, uh, Coleman, La Palma, and Siegel. And that formed the new company that lasted through the 90s. So anyway, Hasbro was spending a lot of money on this stuff. I think they were spending around $3,000 per figure portrait. Um, so Lieutenant Falcon cost them $3,000. You got to spend money to make money. For that painting. Yeah. Um, and so they were spending a lot of money. And let's be candid about the, the Joe numbers, right? In 1985-86, Joe was riding a high. They had a big cartoon investment, obviously, that was uh, ongoing, and it was just extremely popular. By 1989, G.I. Joe was selling half of what it had sold as, at its high watermark. Yeah. So they had to start cutting some costs. You can't keep paying this external packaging company $3,000 per portrait right. when you're selling half of what you used to sell. Something's got to give. And so Hasbro was looking for several years, starting in 1987 and finalizing in 1989, they basically were weaning themselves off of this packaging company. And so by 1989, this packaging company was gone altogether. A 20-year relationship was terminated. Uh, the last stuff that I know of that Hector worked on was a lot of the repaintings, Tiger Force, Night Force, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but I, I can say with you know full confidence that Hector painted every single figure, every single vehicle, every playset from 1982 to 1986. Yeah. And the first time they started supplementing artwork was in 1987. And Daryl DePriest at Hasbro uh, confirmed this at the Hascon panel that Doug Hart was the internal painter who started working on the G.I. Joe brand and became the key driving force internally at Hasbro to take over that load that Hector Garrido and Ed Morrill had been carrying externally. So the first figures that they split were the Battle Force 2000. And uh, Ed Morrill came down and visited this past spring, and I pulled out the Battle Force 2000 single card of figures, and we sat there and tried to pick apart which one was a Garrido, which one was a Hart, and it's honestly pretty easy. Yeah. Um, you can tell a quality difference, and that's not a knock against Doug Hart. Doug Hart's an amazing illustrator. It's uh, a compliment he's just, to Hector, actually. He's just not, he's just not Garrido. So, yeah. so Doug Hart's passion when he came to Hasbro and started doing this stuff was airbrush. How much different is airbrush than gouache? He had to learn a whole different medium and try to master it to the level of a guy that had been painting with gouache for decades commercially. You know what I mean? This guy had been doing book covers and packaging art for 25, 30 years at this point, and he's supposed to come in and learn this medium and match it. It's a very tall order, but I think he did well. Um, you know, the, all of us can tell the difference when we look at it. Yeah. Uh, so the first thing that Doug Hart did internally, and this will this is night and day, if you look at the 1986 um, collage for the the catalog, the Live the Adventure, when they're all the Joes are in the woods and they're moving up the hill, and the Cobras are back here on the on the uh, little background. You got the little kid that's with them that's got his GI Joe backpack on and he's yeah. living the adventure. So that was the last uh, major like, well, not the last one, but in 1987 they used a Doug Hart image, the one with Lieutenant Falcon and the Defiant taking off and the right. uh, Croc Master and the Buzz Boar. That's all Doug Hart's first major contribution to the brand in 1987. So it, it started in 87. Okay. Now, I've heard about this painting over existing uh, works of art for Tiger Force and Night Force. Huh. And huh. 
Why the Abs hell? Like absolutely. So true. the original, the precious original, one of a kind, got painted over. You think of it now as the precious one of a kind original. It's, it's like if the you old put TV yourself... stations like taping over the master tapes because yes. the tapes were expensive, right? Because that was in the past and it wasn't making them money anymore. Right. They were just thinking about what the product was in the future and how's the cheapest way that they can get them to a, a ready product. Right. And so Kurt, Kurt Bazigian has answered this question very candidly. They weren't making collectibles. They were making toys for kids. Yeah. And every year, whole new set of toys. All they're thinking about is how do we produce these new sets of toys as quickly and cheaply as possible? And I mean, just the honest answer is it's easier to paint over a previously existing painting and just swap some colors out than to generate an entirely new painting. But, so they just went the easy route. But the thing I'm wondering is why not print a copy and paint yeah. over the copy? Why, yeah. why paint over the I original? Could, I couldn't tell you in terms of like the medium and how well that would take. Um, you know, if you're using like a photo paper and painting over it, maybe gouache wouldn't, oh, wouldn't take. The texture take difference would be yeah. apparent. Maybe, maybe. I can't, I can't tell you the technical uh, answer for why they did it because with Star, uh, excuse me, with Transformers, for example, we're probably onto something here. You and me just talking through this, we're, we're helping think through this. Yep. Um, Transformers, they did exactly what you just asked. Why didn't they make a print and paint over the print? With Transformers, they did. They got some of the original artwork from Japan. They got, uh, you know, high res prints made and they airbrushed over it. But that's airbrushing. That's not gouache. Yeah. And so maybe maybe just the medium of gouache would not allow for kind of painting over photos. And we weren't at the place where they were doing desktop publishing yet. The Adobe stuff started coming out in the very late 80s. And that agency was on the cutting edge of it. Um, for people so who don't I, know I, what I, gouache is, just quickly sure. uh, explain yeah. what, what is gouache. So gouache is like a watercolor, but it's thicker. It's very mal malleable. Um, I think it dries quickly, so it allows painters to move quickly. It's like so quick when you're drying oil paint, right? Exactly, way quicker than oil. Absolutely, yeah. but thicker the same, than watercolor. The same type of almost clay-like. It's almost yes. sculpting with paint rather than painting. Right. I think you can blend colors pretty well. You can add colors uh, against each other and get nice kind of you know transitional colors and that kind of thing. So I think it's got some of the attributes that artists love with oil, but not the extreme like long drying times. Yeah. If you're an, if you're a, a commercial illustrator, you're not getting paid by the hour. Exactly. You're getting paid by the product. And so the faster that you can move as a commercial illustrator, the more efficient, the more the more efficient you're going to be, the more money you're going to make per hour at the drawing table. And so somebody like Hector Garrido became a master of gouache because it was the fastest way to get a quality product. Yeah. What did he work on after GI Joe? Yeah, I'm glad you asked, asked that question, actually. So the first like 20, 20 or so years were book covers, Time magazine covers. Uh, TV guide illustrations, that kind of thing. Then he moved into the toy packaging art. He only messed with G.I. Joe. He didn't do any Transformers. He actually didn't do any other toy line. He had an exclusive agreement to only do toys for Hasbro, for G.I. Joe, so that that unique look of Hector's was only associated with their toys, which I think makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, and then after that, he had, I don't want to speak to his mental state, but he got into religious art. And he did a ton of these kind of like China plate sets, you know, all the different religious scenes. Um, and I think he produced I, I did a count of it for the book. So usually when I'm working on the books, I get really heavy into research mode and I come up with all these stats and, and that kind of thing. But honestly, I, I, it's not even my day job. My day job is yeah. video and animation for Google, Duke, SunTrust. You know, I've got a ton of other st stuff going on. So I kind of have to, I can't retain everything. But I believe he produced somewhere in the neighborhood of three or four dozen uh, religious pieces in the early 90s, and these things are mass produced. So if you look at uh, Hector Garrido on eBay, any given day, you're going to see this religious artwork nine times, uh, I'd say nine times out of 10. When you search for Hector Garrido, you're going to find that religious artwork from the 90s. You're not going to find G.I. Joe stuff, and you're not going to find like these book covers nearly as often. Well, it doesn't surprise me because his artwork on G.I. Joe is heavenly. So it's yeah, this yeah. is perfect. Um, so your art of GI Joe books, you, uh, you've already said you've taken pictures of things that you actually owned. Um, what I was always hoping was that these are sitting somewhere, the actual masters. Now we know a lot of them have been painted over, but even the ones that were painted over and the ones that weren't, is there any hope for these actually? Cause in the art books that you did, it's great to have a picture of the figure, but yeah. the actual, like you have behind you Falcon yep. with no so bubble and figure I obstructing refer... it. I refer to this as unadorned artwork. Unadorned. It doesn't, 
It doesn't have any graphics on it. It doesn't have any bubbles, any figures overlapping and that kind of thing. So to your point, will we ever find a comprehensive, unadorned G.I. Joe art library? Other than those little trading cards that came out in the 80s, right? Yeah, and those are really low res. I got a set of those and I scanned them. And when you compare those scans to some of the other sources that I've been able to accumulate, it's it's night and day. These are not acceptable okay. representations of that artwork. Well, They're good. great cards. I love that card set. It's by Milton Bradley. It's like 200 cards. It's yeah. almost every painting from 82 to 85 is in there. But then there's some weird exceptions. There's actually some pre-production artwork in, those, in that card set. If you look at the um, Cobra Officer, it's got the red logo. Whereas we all know Cobra Officer ended up with the silver logo. Oh, yeah. The prototype had a red logo and the prototype painting had a red logo. And the prototype painting with the red logo is what's featured in that card set. Also, if you look at the Wolverine with Cover Girl, there's an entirely different portrait, an entirely different face and body for Cover Girl on that Wolverine painting in that card set than what we got at retail. They ended up revising it. That stuff happened a lot. If you look at the uh, if you look at the board game that came out in 1986 that says Live the Adventure on the cover and has that scene of the woods, there's a shot in there of card art for Zarana where her slip is like pulled down a little lower. Yeah. Uh, her pants don't have pink leggings. It's flesh tone. So like the pants were ripped and you just see flesh. Um, there's a little uh, excited nipple there. Um, <laughs> there's, aren't aren't uh, they oh, all? There's, there's, no, there's no shoulder pads. And oh. she's got a dragon tattoo on her arm. Interesting. Because um, so if you look at Zartan, Xandar, and uh, and Zarana, like that's one of the things that's that unify the sibling, them. The that's the sibling signature thing. But you know, it always bothered me with Zarana. Like, how are those attached there? There's no shirt there or anything that they're attached to. We don't see strings or something connecting them. So it, it always kind of bothered me. Yeah. And then it made sense once I saw the prototype painting. Uh, in the Livia Venture board game. And then I got a 1988 international licensing guide folder, which is documented on 3D Joe's. There's line art drawings of that original card art. So it made it like really far down the, uh, de- the design and development process uh, with Zarana and Xandar. And if you look in the Toy Fair catalog, there's photos of these figures that don't have the shoulder armor and they both have dragon tattoos. So the figures were going in a different direction until somebody said, no, let's throw Zartan's uh, shoulder armor on both of them and that'll unify them as a family which i can understand and let's revise that artwork to make her pa- her pant holes actually legging holes yeah. and let's uh let's pull that shirt up a little bit you know what i mean they, they totally changed her artwork I wouldn't, so your question i wouldn't your, say your question, like sorry go ahead oh yeah. uh, your question originally i go off on tangents and i apologize <laughs> no problem good information um the question was, will we ever find a complete unadorned artwork archive? And the unfortunate answer is no. And the reasons for that are, are two or threefold. There was a flood uh, caused by fire. There was a, let me back up. There was a morgue. What they called the morgue was where they put the prototypes and the artwork and it was in the basement. Yeah. There was a fire on the third floor. I, I, I want to just give a, uh, a warning to people watching this. This might be too much for some hardcore fans to handle. You might want to just yeah, go it's and gra- grab a tea for a minute. <laughs> Because this sounds like it's going to be tragic. (laughs) It's truly heartbreaking. And again, it's threefold at least, you know. So there was this fire on the third that flooded down to the basement. So something was destroyed. Um, That was the first flood. There was a second flood due to torrential downpours for multiple days. I don't know what kind of building they were in. I heard they were in the old Peebles, something like that, uh, before they got their kind of bigger, newer headquarters. And the the morgue got flooded that time. Then there was an executive that came in, and he was brand new to the company, and he was looking to make cost-cutting, you know, efforts. And maybe he I should have went away for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> this is breaking my heart. He decided to throw out a ton of the stuff that was in the morgue, no. and I heard that from Ron Rudat, who was working there at the time, and went dumpster diving to save some things. Oh, uh, was so, he able to get anything? Yeah, yeah, he was. Oh, good. So, so long story short, you know, there was a couple floods working against the archiving, and there was a, a trigger happy executive working against the archiving. So, I've I've been to Hasbro since I went to Hascon in 2017. It was amazing. Uh, Daryl and Dan did a wonderful job. They pulled out everything they could find. They consolidated the archives. Daryl personally consolidated everything he could find over the couple years leading up to that, and they put a bunch of uh, paintings out on display. And two ups, you wouldn't believe the two ups, which is the figures that are twice the size that they sculpted them at twice the size and then they shrunk them down for mass production. Yeah. Those two ups are amazing to see in person. They're like so cops, they, right? They're the size of cops. Yeah. Approximately, yes, yeah. yes. And that's what I think when I look at props. I'm like, man, that's the same kind of buck that they used, which is the skeleton underneath the clay. Yeah. Uh, it looks like they just took the GI Joe buck and scaled it up. Yep. But uh, so there's quite a few of these original paintings do exist. We absolutely confirmed without a shadow of a doubt 
They painted over the originals to do the subsets. So they have Tiger Force Duke on an explosion background, not the Tiger Force background, or excuse me, I'm, I'm misspeaking. They have Tiger Force Duke on the Tiger Force Tiger Striped background, yeah. which was 1988, I believe. Yeah. And then they have Crimson Guard, but not on the Python Patrol background. The figure itself is repainted as Python Patrol Crimson Guard, but it's still on the original 1985 kind of explosion background. Mm. Not the, uh, So I think that we can confirm from seeing those two paintings side by side, that from 88 when they made Duke and 89 when they made uh, Python Patrol Crimson Guard, that they started either printing photo paper, doing compositing, you know, with uh, exacto knives and photo paper, or they had ventured into desktop publishing, which was very much around by 1989. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, we, we absolutely have confirmation that any of the subset figures that were re-released, those are painted over and the original version is gone. Mm -hmm. So then you're, then you're searching for, well, what other assets can I find that'll allow me to get that unadorned image uh, at a high enough resolution that's quality enough to reprint. And so one answer to that is Kodak Ektachromes. So back in the day before you had high resolution scanners and Dropbox, you had a photo, a camera here, and a big table down here, and you would take a super high resolution photo on the tabletop of your painting. And that would give you a high resolution Kodak Ektachrome print that you could send, that you could reproduce, and that you could send to Hasbro for approvals or revisions. They would mark up these, these ectochromes. They would put transparency over it. They would write what they want to change and send it back and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. They would also reproduce these ectochromes at a much smaller scale for the salespeople. So when they wanted to go out and show what figures were coming in 1987, I got a folder. It's the unadorned artwork for every figure from 1987. I was so excited when I got that notebook and I haven't used it in the books yet, but maybe in that hardcover you and I were talking about. Oh, that'd be um, beautiful. I've got unadorned artwork for all of 87. I've got unadorned artwork from an international licensing guide for 1985. Um, unfortunately, they did put this like little name logo on the corner of some of those. So some of those are intersected by this, but it's largely unadorned. Yeah. Um, so you, you can either find the Kodak Ektachromes, which have been selling online a little bit, um, or you can find these like licensing guides, which have some of the unadorned artwork reproduced for sales purposes. But there's absolutely not a comprehensive unadorned art archive. And I've actually been talking with one of the guys at Hasbro that's working on something. He can't tell me what, but it's uh, 1982 to 1989. He's trying to consolidate an unadorned art archive from 82 to 89. And I've been trying to help him with a few assets that I have. Oh, that's awesome. That's great to hear. Because when the 25th anniversary figures came out, it was the card art that grabbed me. Card art opened up the, the portal. Now, I'm talking when I was 30 feet away from the wall. Right. I, I just, I traveled through time. When Same. I got up close, I still didn't realize, I noticed Duke is holding the wrong gun, but yep. I still didn't realize, to me, because I hadn't seen the original artwork in 25, 30 years, I thought, yep. this is incredible. What a great idea. And then when I got home and I started doing some comparison, I was like, well, it's better if I don't look at the original because then That's I'll right. be able to appreciate the new one more. But the, right. the more familiar I get with the original now, the more yep. the new one just doesn't cut the mustard, especially when I have Tiger Four, 25th Tiger Force Duke. Who has yeah. that original Duke artwork? And, and it's just no comparison. That's right. Um, I, I talked to Adam Riches about this. Uh, he's an illustrator that's worked with Hasbro. He did a bunch of the club art illustration stuff. Um, that's the G.I. Joe Collectors Club, all the exclusives you know, that they made. He did a lot of the card art for them. So he's a working professional industry guy, and he's talked to a lot of the guys that actually worked on the 25th artwork uh, back in 2007. And it's all digital recreations, and they weren't paying – they weren't paying three thousand per portrait, right? So it can't three, three fifty maybe three three dollars and fifty cents per portrait. It maybe. can't be as good. It's no. just it can't. They couldn't give it the time. They couldn't use that medium. Uh, you know, Hasbro wanted it all layered, editable kind of Photoshop illustrations. So if they wanted to release different versions of it, they could go in and color shift different layers and that kind of thing. That's so right. they're they're all digitally recreated. I love them. It's what brought me back too. I was walking through Target in 2007, 2008, and I saw that Ultimate Battle Pack with the Hiss Tank and the Mobat Trouble Bubble and all that stuff. A dozen figures in there, and it was like, oh my god, they still make these. And I just, you know, went and found the aisle, and I was like, holy shit, I still love this stuff. That made me go home to my parents' house, an hour and 15 minutes away, and finally dig all my stuff out of storage. And then I just went to town, man. I just fell in love with this stuff all over again, like I was a 10 year old again. 
And uh, that was 2008. I didn't start 3D Joe's until 2012, you know, so I was just a collector like everybody else for a few years. And then I was like, you know, I've got a skill set here with graphic design. Um, I've got a passion for this thing that's never ending. It's a lifelong passion. And how many of those do you really have in your life? Yeah. Um, what can I do to marry these two things? And so I, I backed a Kickstarter for Arc Spin, which is that 360 photography software. And as soon as that arrived, I was like, that's it. GI Joe archive using 360 photography. Cause nobody's done that. And I knew with my like graphic design background and expertise, I would be able to present a really clean, elegant, and also owning all the stuff so I can document everything myself and not have that kind of inconsistent crowdsourcing yeah. uh, archive. Um, I absolutely love the other guys. You know who I'm talking about. I think they're irreplaceable and 3D Joe's is not a replacement for them, but they've relied on crowdsourcing, right? So it's been inconsistent over the years of documentation. So I just wanted to do it, do it more minimalist, but at a higher visual quality. Well, kind I, of thing. I appreciate the approach that you've taken with 3D Joe's. And I was going to ask you how that whole thing started, but um, yeah. there, you know, in, in any fan community, whether it's GI Joe, Transformers, Star Wars, Unfortunately, uh, you know, a lot of people who are into this type of stuff, it's like uh, like a replacement uh, for sports. So you've got your sports fans who are go my team and I despise the rival team. I hate them. And it's yeah. such a shame whenever I see that type of mentality in the toy community. Go my website or the website yep. I'm a fan of. I despise this new guy. And it was really... It Anybody was really who's bad. Like started a new thing. You do yeah. get the backlash of who the hell do you? I call it the who the hell do you think you are backlash yeah. of when you're passionate and you're like, hey guys, I love this stuff, and yeah. you do get support, but you also get a lot of go away. We've got a guy. So yeah. I, I've always appreciated that you have that mentality of hey, it's not a competition. I love the other guys. I'm not trying yeah. to take anything away from anybody, but GI yeah. Joe is a community that really needs someone like you putting out this uh, beautiful art. And it's not just about the books too. That's what I really love about what you do. You have the books for the people who can afford them, who want them. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't have a dime to your name, 3D Joe's is free and you can spend yep. a whole day, just like you could spend a day at Toys R Us or a toy store. You could spend a yep. day on 3D Joe's and it's been an invaluable part of my videos too for the gaps in my collection. And I'm yep. like, what? well, I want to showcase this, but I don't want to just show a quick picture and you're so gracious to allow me to use those awesome 3D spins so that I can I show it. people. I don't have it, but here Carson has taken a 3D yeah. of it and you can see it from every angle. And that's what I'm all about, man. I just want to share the love, share the passion for it. Like I said, I don't have a single ad on my website. It's not driving me any revenue. I want people to experience this and love it like I love it. You know, I want to try to help keep it vibrant and alive and available and accessible. Like if you go to 3D Joe's and go under figures and go to the G.I. Joe yearbook, if that doesn't take you back, it's yeah. every single figure from 1982 to 1994, every single carded figure on one page. Just scroll that page. If that doesn't take you back to the toy aisles, like you were saying, searching through for that familiarity and that love for that one figure, um, then then you don't love GI Joe. You know what I mean? So so I love the website. It's been uh, it's been a tremendous endeavor for me. I've I've made you know, creative, uh, deliverables my entire, since I was six, when I was in sixth grade, I started drawing comic books from sixth grade to 12th grade. I drew six comic books, wrote my own stories, drew 22 to 24 pages, just like creative. Like I just have to work on stuff all the time. When and you then immerse I went yourself in creativity, like GI Joe, I mean, every yep. GI Joe was creatively created from head to toe. And then you flip the card. So it's yep. not just, here's what he looks like. Here's the art. Here's the accessories. Then you flip the card and you get his real name, his birth town, his yep. bio, a quote. It's like every guy is like an hour's worth of research and, yep. and creativity. Absolutely, man. One of, the, one of the things that bonded me for life to G.I. Joe was my dad was a third, uh, a third Special Forces Group executive officer out of Fort Bragg, North Carolina. We were living in Southern Pines, North Carolina. Lieutenant Falcon came out in 87. I'm eight years old. My dad is this executive officer with third group. And then you flip over his file card and he's an executive officer with either third group or fifth group. And he did language school. My dad went to Monterey and did language school, learned yeah. Farsi uh, when I was a young kid. Like the similarities were he was literally 15 minutes down the road. That was like a lifelong connection for me. Um, my, my dad was gone the whole year of 1989 operating in El Salvador. And man, if Lieutenant Falcon didn't go on adventures with me, 
you know, not every day, but at least every weekend. It was it was very much these little plastic figures were like this personification of, of my dad kind of going on these missions and stuff. So there's no telling where a kid is in the United States or Canada or wherever um, that they're going to see somebody and be like, I know that place. You know, they're, they're just going to identify with either where they're from or what their background is or what their psychological profile is on those file cards. You know, like Deep yeah. Six was a recluse. There's probably a kid that didn't like other kids and was like, Deep Six is my guy. Yeah. <laughs> you or, know, or, or like that's the great thing that you bring up about G.I. Joe. Transformers, I don't know how many people, I mean, there's Trailbreaker fans, there's Ratchet fans, but most people, you know, they love Megatron or, or Optimus or, or some more of the upper echelon guys. But G.I. Joe, it seems more like it's not that many people going, Duke, Duke is my guy. Everyone loves right. Duke. But G.I. Joe's the line where, like yourself, Lieutenant Falcon, and there isn't like a giant Lieutenant Falcon following. Snow right. job for the right. for the Snow Joes, right? Yep. And for me, it was Xandar because of his file card. Xandar had oh, wow. this this ability to just kind of be invisible, and that's who I was in high school. Like, uh, yeah. what was on his file card? Something about they didn't even know he was there. Wow. He just had this ability to to you know not literally disappear and cloak himself, but he was the guy who could just kind of float and slip through. And I remember reading that because I read all the file cards and going. Yep. Man, like that is the one that really resonates with me. I just, I, I just I, pulled him up. Yep. Xandar was the kid who never got noticed. Teachers forgot he was there and never called on him. Nobody that has ever met him can remember what his voice sounds like. His anonymity was no accident. He worked at it all through his formative years, and after he grew up, he got even better at it. Well, I wasn't the the president of uh, you know the student body or anything like that. I just kind of quietly weaved my way through school. And of all the Joes and Cobras, of all the file cards I read, that one I was like, I don't yeah. have to like aspire to be that. I am that. Like it's crazy. I would not sit at the very back, but just yeah. like two from the back, you know, like right. and or just off to the side, and hardly ever got called on. Just kind of floated through, you know, school. Did great at it, but didn't yeah. want the attention. So it's amazing right. that every single file card, uh, someone can read it, and you never know. It could be Psych Out. It could be Bullhorn. Mm -hmm. And yep. people are like, that's my guy. That's how diverse yep. the Joe team was. And then, and then if you wanted to go di a deeper into it, you just picked up the comic books. And then there was yes. endless storylines or the, or the pick a path novels, you know, the Ballantine Absolutely. books. There was just so much material available to us back then to like immerse ourselves in this world. It, it is an incredible world. And for people who don't know anything about Star Trek and they think, oh, it's, it's so overwhelming or, or Star Wars Lord of the Rings, anything like that, Game of Thrones, you think you're getting into this big world. Some people who don't know much about Joe might think, well, it's it's G.I. Joe. What's the big deal? It's army yeah. guys, right? No, it is just as big as any of those big uh, fandoms that I've mentioned before. All you yep. got to do is flip the card. And yep. all of a sudden, you are in this giant world. All the stories, you know, apart from the cartoons, Larry Hama's stories... Not just the Marvel run, but the special missions as well. His current mm -hmm. IDW run, and then everything yeah. not written by him. Uh, it's it's huge. It, to me, it's just as it big is. as Trek or Star Wars. Yeah, I I would encourage anybody out there that hasn't picked up a GI Joe comic book in decades. Um, obviously, pick up Larry Hamas because he's the Godfather that started this universe. You know, um, but also pick up the IDW Cobra series. Uh, they have a hardcover for it called The Last Laugh. It's by Gage and Costa. And that freaking series is amazing. That story blew me away. It is incredible. They take some second tier characters and just, man, they give them more dimensionality than they've ever had before. And it's just an amazing storyline. There's so much good stuff out there. But, uh, but if you don't believe me, start with Cobra The Last Laugh and see if that'll hook you. That's the still untapped potential of G.I. Joe. Uh, mm -hmm. When I was talking to Chris from uh, Full Force Podcast, he mm -hmm. brought up this idea of a special mission style of story about Lightfoot. Because I said, Lightfoot's never done it for me. I just, yeah. I, I've seen the figure thousands of times and never picked him up. Just don't care. And he yeah. told me this interesting story about Lightfoot diffusing a bomb and his little robot guy. I didn't even know that was a bomb sniffing robot blows yep. up and the emotional toll it takes on him because he connects with this robot more than human oh, beings. Oh, wow. And oh, that, wow. That, that kind of, you know, it, it burrowed into my brain like, yeah. really? And so I saw Lightfoot like a few days later at a local toy convention. And instead of, oh, he's ugly, I looked at it and I looked at the little robot guy and I got sad. And I was like, 
Oh, it's his little robot buddy that he loves more than... It's his only friend. Yeah, it's his only friend. And I picked it up, and I love the figure now because of that little story, that character story that Chris provided him because he yep. hasn't been provided it yet so well I, I hate to i hate to push you but have another look at night force light uh lightfoot it's it's a pretty pretty good looking figure night force, uh yeah i gotta check that one out too i also yeah. wanted to ask you how does it work with hasbro that when you mm-hmm. put the books out like the, the the website can be a fan website you can put whatever sure. you want on it and you won't get the um the brass breathing down your neck yeah you know but how yeah. does it uh, what kind of relationship do you have with hasbro to be able to publish these uh these yeah. I think I think I think I've earned some credibility and some goodwill by putting out a website that's garnered five million page views from over a million people with no ad revenue. Uh, I think that's the that's the first entry point. I think it's in the right place. It says, yeah, Yeah. I I think so. I think that's I think that's gotten me a long way. Um, I've been having conversations with Hasbro since 2012, 2013, whenever the Jocon Indianapolis was. That was my first uh, introduction to the Hasbro powers that be. And, uh, and I've been in touch. There's been many emails back and forth and everything's been so far so good. Um, like I said, there's a Hasbro, uh, designer right now working on something and I'm trying to help them with assets, you know? So I I think they see me, uh, you know, when Mark Weber was in charge of the brand, we sat down at casino night and he talked to me very candidly about their perception of me as a, a brand ally, a brand advocate, somebody that's helping them keep GI Joe relevant and alive uh, during times of low tide like now. Yeah. Uh, so I just think I just think I've engendered the goodwill of the company. I sure hope that's the case. I, I think they see my heart's in the right spot. I'm very transparent too about like if I do a Kickstarter and raise, for example, the final, the grand finale Kickstarter that published volumes five and six in the slipcase. Oh, that slipcase so beautiful. I raised. I raised forty-seven thousand dollars in two weeks to create those. Um, I spent fifty-eight making the books and making the slipcase. So I automatically like it looks like okay, this guy's raising a bunch of money, but wait, <laughs> he's actually putting all of it into the product and then some. I've since broken even because I had leftovers after I fulfilled the Kickstarter backers. And uh, you know, once you're selling the leftovers, you start to recoup your loss or whatever. But uh, I think they see that my heart's in the right place. I'm not trying to make a killing off of it. I'm doing it out of genuine, lifelong love. And, uh, and I'm trying to help them with their efforts as well. So um, there hasn't been like a formal contract in place, but there's certainly been many emails back and forth and, and many friendly conversations. Yeah. They, actually, they actually encouraged me to put a lot, of my own, a lot more of my own voice into it. So you'll notice in the first couple books, there's like 2,000 words per book because I didn't want it to be about me. I'm not... This isn't about Carson. This is about G.I. Joe, right? Yeah. And so it was It was kind of sparse in terms of words. I figured if you want words, you go to 3djoes.com and you can read about every one of these and I talk my butt off. But if you just want – I wanted my art books to be about the artwork and to keep it minimal in that way. And, and the brand manager at the time, a, a vice president there at the time said, we know you know the research. We know you've had the conversations. We've seen your creator pages, that kind of thing. Put more of that stuff into these books because you're not allowed to uh, – if you look under the Fair Use Act and look under the compilations part of the Fair Use Act, you're yeah, I was allowed to ask you about that. You're allowed to create compilations as long as there's uh, like research significance added to it. There's got to be something added to it. You can't just like say take all the Marvel comic books GI Joe covers and put them on put them in a book. You know, just yeah. just make a 250 page book that has all the covers from you know then to now. You can't do that. But if you went through and, and you know did interviews with Larry Hama and Ron Wagner and everybody that's worked on G.I. Joe and that's created these covers, you could make an argument for you know fair use research, uh, adding something of worth to it. And so they encouraged me. They were like, look, we know you know your stuff. We know you've done the interviews. Add more of yourself to these books. And I gratefully did that. Um, so you know, you'll, you'll notice around volumes four, certainly five and six, there's a lot more words in there. And uh, it's also um – awesome that you uh, offer posters there as well and this is one of my favorite pieces yes, in sir. my entire collection like yes, this, this to me is artwork i had it mounted uh put uh, they put a not a laminate cover but like a matte laminate yes yeah, like a matte sort finish of, yeah sort yeah. of protect it and like i i won't have uh won't be able to get a uss flag box just because of the cost and the size of it i, I don't have any place to put it but what a perfect thing that it, it's the exact same size as the original one and all the posters yeah. too and and such great prices for those too also like for the people who can't afford every single car to joe uh they can have a poster a really affordable big poster with all of them on it row by row 
And it kind of gives you that same feeling when you just see a wall of G.I. Joe's. Uh, How much work have you done to those? Because you have touched them up a little bit, right? The uh, contrast and and colors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I I I saw like an original card at a local toy show recently and it looked washed out. Mm -hmm. And I'm remembering like that's how they look brand new. That's not the sun damage to it. It looks a little little gray. Yeah. So the, the printing process at times can can basically take blacks and make them gray. Right. Um, so you're, you're losing some of that contrast ratio that you would really want in the original artwork. So I try to not do anything to the artwork that's going to ever lose any detail. So I, I don't ever blow out the whites to where you're losing detail in some of the white areas. Mm-hmm. And I try not to crush the blacks is what we call it in the industry. Yep. I try not to crush the blacks to the point that you're losing any detail in the shadows. Um, but I will, you know, if you go into the levels and you look at the kind of waveform mountainside, I will bring the blacks over to where the blacks actually start and I'll bring the whites over to the, where the whites actually start without losing any detail. Um, another trick of the trade, I'll also usually go into the saturation and bump that up 15, 20%. Cause I think just a lot of saturation has lost over 20 years of a product sitting on a shelf. Yeah. And, uh, all these photos for the cards, all those are photos from the carded figure collection that I was able to acquire over 2008 to maybe 2014 when I started on this I had a you know a good six-year period there where I collected every single card of figure from 1982 to 1994 and uh, so those were photos from my own collection and I absolutely touched them up in Photoshop you know going around with the lasso around the edges blowing the white border out to actual white if there was any scuffing or any of that kind of stuff on it and so the first thing that I did was make posters um, that was the first kind of product that I sold through the website to try to pay for the website. Cause there's a cost involved of running the website, yep. paying the arc spin 360 photo subscription, hosting, all those things cost money. And so the reason that I made that first poster, which was the, uh, 3d Joe's of the eighties, which was every figure from 1982 all the way down to 1989. I put that thing on my credit card. It cost me $3,000 and I gambled on it. I just gambled on it. And it took me, I think four months to break even on that, on that gamble but then after that four months, all the inventory I was sitting on could now start to be profit, right? So that was my first poster. And I did, uh, my first Kickstarter was three more posters. And people were like, dude, we love your posters. We love your website. We love what you're doing, but we're running out of wall space. Can you do books? And that's literally what planted the seed that grew into collecting the art of G.I. Joe, you know, four or five years later now. I've got this five and a half pound baby of every painting ever made from 82 to 94. And I've never done a project that took me that long. I've never put that much of myself into any one deliverable. And that's incredibly rewarding. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And with the slip case, because I, I had the early ones and I loved yep. them so much. Uh, but they were, you know, kind of more so, magazine-like than book-like. And I thought soft the, cover. the yeah. only thing is where do I put them? So I kind of lean right. them against the flag. I'm like, that's... Yep not quite right. And it couldn't stack them on a shelf. I'm like that when the slip, yeah. uh, again, my buddy Lou uh, got it before I got it. And he's like, do you know about this? <laughs> I'm like, what the heck is this? Opens it up and they're all in there. I'm like, Oh, perfect. Absolutely is, beautiful. You raise an issue that I wanted to address from day one. Um, the, the you know, displayability of this set, so to speak, I, d- I chose that format for a very real and very – it was a conscientious decision on my part from a design perspective. If I'm going to do two-page spreads, I'm not going to have a hardcover yeah. because you're going to lose some of that artwork into the binding. With these soft covers, you could lay it flat and basically spread the page out and you see everything. So I chose to do soft covers up front because I knew I wanted to do two-page spreads of, for example, the 1983 headquarters, right? Yeah. But, you know, once I had that product and those AccuFoil covers with the three dimensionality was like a perfect match for 3D Joe's. Um, So I was very happy with the initial product, but you can't really stick a floppy copy on the shelf and hope that it kind of stands up and lets it's wedged between two other books. And that's no fun. Right. So uh, so when I got to the end, I knew I just needed to make it to the end and I was going to make something that would hold it. Um, pro- I, I thought initially that it was just going to be a five-sided box with an open end that you stuck them into. But then if you pictured looking at those, you would just see the folded spine. You'd see the folded uh, foil kind of cover, which isn't uh, glamorous either. So I went to my printer. My printer's awesome. And we started talking about uh, options, what we could do. And he showed me one of these double box slip cases. And I was like, there it is. Because all, you know, all six sides have beautiful artwork on it. And then you open it up and there's a whole other box with artwork on it. It's just amazing. Yeah. So, I, I, you know, thanks to the 420 people that backed me on that Kickstarter, we were able to do that. 
And it, just being a toy collector, there's just something ingrained in our DNA that we like to have awesome things in boxes. Yeah, And we're so careful about the boxes too. And the box art is just as important. So the fact that these beautiful books of art are held in a box with box art on it, yep. to me is just perfectly fitting. And I'm looking up at mine right now. It's up right beside my mobile command center and headquarters boxes right yep. in front of them. So I've, I've got mine. I've got those uh, bookends, the uh, Storm Shadow and Snake Eyes bookends. And, uh, and mine's up there with you know, uh, Belomo's current series, which is up to volume eight of the ultimate GI Joe, uh, comic book with the special missions woven in the right sequential order and Dan Kay's books and Mark uh, Belomo's older books is, uh, his collecting GI Joe books, uh, James Cavanaugh's books. I mean, we all love these GI Joe books. We're a very lucky, um, community to have this many people that care about this stuff this much that will make these things for this little profit, yeah. <laughs> right? Because yeah. G.I. Joe is not a, it's not a huge crowd like Star Wars or Transformers to where if you make one of these books, you're going to make a killing. That's I'll true. be honest and transparent with everybody out there. You're not going to. You're not going to make a killing on these. But if you love it, it's not work. You just enjoy doing it. You want to see it come to life, and so you make it happen. And uh, one of my favorite things to do now with that box set is to take it around and get it signed by the Larry Hamas and the Kirk oh, Bazigians cool. and the Sergeant Slaughters of the world. And uh, like I was saying, man, I've never I've never worked on a project that took me you know four years to produce like these books did. And so it's incredibly rewarding to be at the end of that and and have this thing to show off and to hear from people like you that do these like impassioned kind of walkthroughs of the books. Like to, for me to hear you enjoying it is pretty surreal, you know. Man, I loved it. It really took me back, and I I appreciated the passion and the attention to detail you put into it just as much as I appreciated all of the artwork that you gathered and, and put into it. And it might feel to a lot of G.I. Joe fans like we're in a dry spell, nothing's happening. Uh, I say nay, nay. I disagree. There's things happening. Just It might not have a Hasbro logo in the bottom corner. Right. It's about uh, if you want something done right, you got to do it yourself. And that's not saying Hasbro is doing anything wrong. It's just they're not doing anything at the moment. Uh, and mm -hmm. even if when they start doing things again for the Snake Eyes movie, if that comes out, uh, it, it, you don't necessarily have to just uh, buy Hasbro products. There are amazing fan-made products out there too, projects, mm -hmm. even websites, nonprofit things. So you, it's all, you're allowed. You're allowed to yeah. go and buy the art of 3D Joes, even if it's not put out by Hasbro. And, you know, that doesn't mean that it didn't have a lot of passion put into it. Uh, uh, just to wrap up here, because we're coming up at about an hour. Uh, sure. Quantities of the art of G.I. Joe are dwindling, right? I actually have a great uh, update on that. So I went back to my printing press in Greenville, uh, North Carolina, and had – so basically – here was the conundrum that I was facing. I had 96 slip cases left and those slip cases cost $17,000 to print. Yeah. They'll never be made again. I'll, yeah. I'll never be able to, I can't put that on a credit card. You know what I mean? So, and I won't be able to fundraise against this again because you can you know, the sell people them that, as play sets, <laughs> put wheels right. on them. It's a tank. <laughs> So the challenge was, you know, when I printed a thousand of each volume, some people just wanted to buy this volume and not that volume. Yeah. And so I got these uneven numbers and obviously volumes one and two are the first to sell. And so those are the first to sell out. So I have really good news, actually. Um, I did a book count. My uh, sister has gone through all the inventory. We have these like nick and dent piles where if there was an imperfection, like a, you know, a wrinkle on a page or like a scuff on a cover, that kind of thing. I set those aside because I'm a perfectionist, you know? Yeah. And so what I've been doing for the last like 15, 20 sets is pulling from the nick and dent pile. That's not really bad. And uh, putting sets together and selling those with that uh, disclosure on the website. So I, I did an inventory of everything and I had like 96 slip cases left and those were $17,000 to produce. I'll never be able to produce them again. You know how nice they are. Yeah. It felt, it felt like a waste to not be able to sell full sets, to, to fill those boxes and sell those sets yeah. before I do whatever I do next, right? Um, so I actually went back to my printer at, in Greenville, spent $7,000 last week to, to buy digital uh, reprints of, version, of volume one, volume two, and volume four, which had sold out, um, to create enough sets to fill those boxes. Awesome. I'll be selling sets uh, for another 96 sets, and then they're done. Like they are, they're just done. I'll never be able to, you know, if the slipcase was 17 and offset lithograph prints of each of those volumes were 10, then to reprint all six volumes and reprint that slipcase, it would be $77,000. I'd have to take out a home equity line of credit, you know? Yeah. 
to reprint those, and it's just not going to happen. And I crowdsourced to make all of those the first time. I don't want to go back to the well with the 2,000 or so backers that I've had over the years and say, hey, remember this thing that was awesome the first time? Can you help me print it again? Like that just didn't feel right. So I'm going to continue selling uh, the collected, collecting the art of GI Joe slipcases with all six volumes inside for another 96 sets, and then they're gone. That's awesome. So if you can, you know, for the folks out there who don't have one and you really want the collected art of GI Joe, it's probably not going to happen coming from the official source. Uh, Carson's the man who did all of the work. He put in all the effort. He went above and beyond. And I think uh, Joe fans are very lucky that you're sharing your collection with us. That's something that I, once my collection was done, my toy uh, museum was done, it's something that I just couldn't sit there and sit in a room by myself and enjoy yes. myself. I, I felt and I, compelled. I love, I love what you're doing with YouTube, man. It's so impassioned. It's Thank so you. chill to listen to. The Nerd Mustay stuff like fits you perfectly. Thank like you. I can I can put on a Michael Mercy video and just kind of chill, man. Just listen to it. And it's like, this guy gets it. Well, <laughs> you know this, what I mean? This stuff makes me happy. So I, exactly. I like to uh, surround myself with things that make me happy, not yep. with things that make me unhappy. And when I was yep. done the collection... I never uh, anticipated this. I, I thought I'm doing this so that I, I have a great place to go sit down and have fun. And when I was yeah. done, I looked around and I went, but what about everybody else? And that's yep. when the door opened and I started showing it off. And I think it's just wonderful that you have all these incredible pieces of art that you've collected because you love the art and you've opened the yep. door and said, you yep. know, and the website and the books yep. and say, now everyone Thanks. gets to share. That was the absolute intent of building 3djoes.com. Just take this thing that I've amassed over six years and share it with everybody, you know, and, and who knows where it's going to lead you. And I've, I've watched you. Uh, I'm just amazed by your growth on YouTube. It's awesome to watch, man. I, I was never an overly like social community based person. I was never on like the Yojo message boards or his tanks message boards, or, um, you know, I haven't created any Facebook groups or anything like that. I wasn't an overly social kind of put myself out there in the forefront kind of person, but I did want to create an archive that I could share this stuff through. And so that's what 3d Joe's became. And then of course, you know, as I've met some creators and done some Joe con panels and done some comic book convention panels and that kind of, I'm, I'm starting to put myself out there uh, a little more, but I look at guys like you and Hooded Cobra Commander like, holy shit, man, they are masters at this. You know, and, and I know you're not doing it for nefarious reasons. You're not doing it for profiteering. You're just doing it because you love it and you want to connect with other people that love it. I'm and and I, it, yeah. it's amazing, man. It's such a great community and you get out of it what you put into it. Well, I'm the guy who uh, Xandar's file card resonated with me. So, I, right. you know, every single time I fire up the camera, it's not like, you know, hello, my baby. Hello, my honey. Like, I, yeah. I can't do that thing right. that some YouTubers do where I'm you know, screaming and yelling and, you know, doing yep. all the erratic hand movements and stuff. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's why I'm just a chill person. And I don't, I don't right. like to put on a persona when I turn the camera on. So, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, that's, Absolutely. that's what it's all about. And I'm very lucky. Uh, I'm extremely lucky. And, and this whole thing has opened up doors so that, you know, I can send out an invite and say, Hey, Carson, love your yep. stuff. You want to just sit down and chat for a bit. No. Same here, man. My, my absolute biggest honor. And uh, okay, so I started in 2012 in the last seven years of building 3D Joe's. My biggest honor is the fact that, you know, Ron Rudak, Kirk Bazigian, Guy Cassidy, Larry Hama, they've all opened up their homes to me. I've yeah. gone in and sat with them and done interviews and most of them were audio and they're just on the creators tab of 3D Joe's. And Larry, I did a 3D Joe's Cribs episode where I show up with my camera cool. and we're just like, we walk through his house and then we talk for a while. It's just, it's amazing when you, you like I was just saying, you get out of this what you put into it and Absolutely. you've put in enough consistent effort. You've, you've shared enough good vibes with everybody that people are going to say yes when you ask them for something. Oh, I you know, appreciate that. I, and I would love to talk to Larry, but I think it would just be like chill overload because he'd be like <laughs> in the chair. Hey, and I'd be yeah. like, sup, brother? You guys are pretty chill. You guys are so, pretty chill. I don't know if it would be the the high octane interview that uh, or chat that people would be expecting, but it would be interesting to be talk great. to Mr. Ham. I'd but, certainly chill out and listen to it. But Carson, thanks so much for your time today. It's been awesome talking with you. 
I feel My like pleasure. we just scratched the surface on, uh, you know, we talked mostly about art. It'd be awesome to talk about the toys next time. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm here and available, man. I love talking with you, man. You're a great dude. And I appreciate all the energy you're putting into the community. And I'm, yeah, again, happy to pick up the line and do this again whenever, whenever makes sense for both of us. Appreciate that so much. I'll talk to you in five minutes then. <laughs> all right, sounds good. <laughs> you know, but uh, for, for folks, you've probably heard of 3D Joe's. If you haven't, check out the website. It's a fantastic, incredible resource. There's a YouTube channel as well with some great videos on there as well. Uh, and the posters, like the one behind me, and, and books. Yay, the books are available again. I'm really happy for the people who will be able to pick some of those up. 96 sets and counting, man. Awesome. Thanks so much again, yep. Carson. Everybody out there, thanks for watching. And until next time, Yo Joe! Joe!